says number of bit per seconds. Okay, now this go to, uh, to the processor. There is what is called o OSI model for just, just uh, governing or describing this. Go to the processor and the processor itself, they cluster them and decides, okay, I would like to send this part. B by the way, it is not necessarily that they are sent separately based on the application. You may interleave. You, there are many, many aspects uh, related to noise, related to what happens if I don't have a communication for a couple of milliseconds. Should I, I deteriorate the speech? or deteriorate the movie, or I may distribute this, uh, this disturbance before, between all applications so that any of the applications doesn't feel anything. Such decisions, it is a smart decision, how can I multiplex data, how can I distribute them from here to there and so on. If you look to the, uh, to the algorithm, the software algorithm written for this purpose, it's really huge. It's a very, very big challenge. And you have two possibilities, either to uh, program as it is, and in this case, your infrastructure will not help you. Because in this case, you need very, very long uh, programs, classically written, traditionally implemented, and so on, so you can forget it. Or we need your expertise, we need your intelligent programming, in order how can I minimize the complexity and minimize the uh, power consumption for performing such a digital signal processing which enable such applications. Have I answered the question? Okay. Okay, so I don't need to repeat again. Okay, that's great. Let us go because uh, according to my understanding, you would like to know some details about the calculations. So what I skipped is uh, how to model a wireless channel uh, how to uh, prove that multiple reflection will uh, help MIMO. And uh, I think something related to beam forming and beam steering. I will concentrate on that because uh, we have time only up to uh, 1 p.m. So I will concentrate on that. But at any time, if you feel from, from the uh, view graphs here, uh, that you need uh, more explanation here, just, just let me know. Okay, so I will skip that <coughs> and come here. This is the, the model of uh, multi-channel communication. We have a transmitter and a receiver, and I assume that we have key channels connecting them. Of course, for wired, communi wired communication, it is, it is evident. So you can connect with multiple cables or something like that. But for wireless, uh, I would like now to talk something about why do we need the, the multiplexing? Why do we need multiple channels? You have actually two categories of advantages. Either what is called diversity, which means if uh, one of the channels uh, suffers from high attenuation or uh, high bit error rate, you would like to duplicate the transmission so that one channel helps the other. This is a diversity. Or if everything works uh, nice, so you say, okay, I will, I will increase the uh, data rate. So I have a certain data rate and I will subdivide it into streams and I send uh, each stream through a channel. Uh, what, what, uh, which factors affect your decision? Uh, whether you are, well, of course, a combination of both is also possible. So to use some of your capacity for increasing throughput and uh, part of the capacity just for diversity in order to, uh, to increase the, uh, uh, or to decrease the bit error rate. Uh, using what is called uh, channel coding, uh, where am I? Oh, I shouldn't. Does it, for some reason, it is it isn't didn't work anymore. As a pointer, it it, it does. Oh, uh, I think I know. So it needs some some. Uh, can can you pl plug it, please?
Yes. <coughs> Imagine that. Uh, may I assume that you 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 attended a course on uh, on coding, channel coding? Do you know what is channel coding? So in channel coding, you try to inflate the data by adding some control bits or parity bits in order for the receiver to detect errors and to correct errors. And this uh, will give us uh, another area of comparison because you may say, I have a bad channel and the bit error rate is high. Should I now make use of diversity in order to uh, improve the bit error rate? Or I take, I'll make use of the high capacity by inflating the data by involving good channel coding, and I, uh, of course, I will I will have less information bits than the transmitted bits. Okay, so now now it is a, a matter of comparison. Should it be diversity alone, or should it be an additional channel coding with higher data rate, and I can make use it for for data rate and and if you look uh, for uh, for increasing the uh, the the data rate uh, most research are just playing with this aspect so if you look at any paper so you can say okay if i i can increase the net uh, the, uh, uh, put through uh, uh, of of the whole thing and so on okay so therefore i uh, give here some some uh, some description here if you have a higher snr signal to noise ratio which means noise is always there which means a better channel noise is always there so be better channel means a lower bit error rate so uh, i can use the higher capacity for higher data rate if i have a Special diversity, I, or the special diversity itself, it increases the, the effective SNR and uh, it decreases the bit error rate. With the channel coding, uh, I have the data rate to bit rate. Data rate is the actual data rate to bit rate goes down, and the data, but the bit data bit error rate goes also down. Okay, these are the different scenarios which you can think about uh, in order to decide. Okay, how can I make use of the additional of the value added uh, uh, capacity for my usage, okay? Now, uh, another point which I talked very, very quickly about, how, how would you like to model a wireless channel? Because in your study, you usually used linear time invariant systems, which are uh, systems with uh, resistors, capacitors, amplifiers, and so on, which are uh, time independent. And in this case, you have what is called transfer function, and uh, you may work in the frequency domain or the type domain, everything which you are used to do. For wireless channel, we have actually, so I compare here between linear time invariant, in which if you, if you excite the channel here, the system with a Dirac, at time t1 dash, it will respond with this, this uh, say, uh, impulse response. If you wait a little bit and excite again, you will have exactly the same impulse response but shifted. This is a characteristic of linear time invariant. For li linear time varying, if you uh, excite, this is just kick it by Dirac, at t1 dash, you will have certain impulse response. If you uh, excite it later, you have another one. This is li linear time varying. Therefore, here you can say the only variable here is a single variable. If you, if you put your axis here uh, and you have the same function like if you put your axis here, the same function. So actually you are dealing with a single variable function, which is a, the, the, uh, the impulse response. For linear time varying, it's still linear. So if you, if you put two signals, so the, the output is a summation of the two outputs. But I need here two time axes, two variables. When have I excited? And how does the impulse response look like? OK? As you see here, the uh, ultimate form for linear time varying, this edge, it, impulse response, is function of the time at which you excited and the time itself. 
For linear time varying, this one here becomes a function of single variable, which is the difference between both, and it makes things easier. Okay, if we insist, if we now work with time, linear time varying, because if you, if you look to a wireless channel, uh, if I move now, so I change the channel. You have the transmitter here, the receiver here. So if you move, if somebody comes in, if uh, a chair is moved and so on. So actually you have a continuously varying uh, channel. The problem is how to communicate nevertheless. Therefore, communication people define what is called coherence time. The coherent time is which time uh, or over which time slot. Can I assume that the, the impulse response or the transfer function doesn't change? And uh, the entire wireless communication uh, depends on, I will send what is called pilots signals which are known to the uh, receiver and the receiver receives and compare actually he knows or it knows what what was sent uh, and in order to let him find a model a channel model so you know uh, if you have in frequency domain y output is h transfer function times x if you know x and y x is known you can find h this is sensing or sounding. Uh, if now you know H and Y, you can find X. This is communication. And, and any receiver nowadays is working alternatively. So actually, I sense, find the model, pray that the model will continue valid for the next couple of uh, milliseconds, and then I retrieve information, and quickly I sense again, and I do it this way. So this is actually the way uh, modern receivers or smart receivers are working nowadays. Sensing, building a model, using the model for retrieving information, and so on. Okay? But in order to have uh, feeling what is the coherency time, what is the bandwidth, and so on, uh, mathematically you can, oh, you can uh, uh, describe the transfer function of linear time varying using double Fourier transform. One for the delay, which is called tau. It, it was actually our time axis in the past for li linear time varying. And one for the t. So you need two variables. Therefore, you need, t f you need two frequencies. One is your known frequencies, let us call it f, and the other one is called nu. So you have two frequencies. And now you have a two-dimensional uh, function, which is uh, double Fourier transform, it is transfer function. If you look to such uh, uh, a representation, you can immediately say, okay, which type of, of transfer function is this? Uh, for linear time varying, uh, time invariant, this one here is infinitely thin and infinitely high. It's a Dirac. So therefore, the, this width here, this width along the new new axis gives me an impression or uh, a feeling how fast the channel changes okay if it changes very very slow i have very very thin mountain okay if it is rapidly changing i have wide mountain okay so and this one here this is the traditional bandwidth you know the fourier transform of the impulse response this is the transfer free function so this is the bandwidth and this here gives me an indication or a feeling of how fast the channel is because this will influence my decision how often uh, should I update the information of the receiver about the transfer function. How often should I put pilot signals for the receiver to build its own model for the transfer function. And don't forget that this is uh, uh, this, these are costs. If you increase the pilots because you send, you send it frequently, so you decrease actually the throughput. Huh? So therefore, you, 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 you can have an idea about how much pilots, how much uh, throughput, and so on. Okay? And this is actually done nowadays uh, very, very uh, smartly so that you don't need the receiver and transmitter. They communicate with each other in order to meet a decision. 
I, I don't think that this is here important. This is just uh, one case. What happens if uh, if the receiver move or the transmitter move? How does this two uh, dimensional Fourier transform look like and uh, what is the relation between the two dimensional Fourier transform let me explain it quickly if you uh, if you have a moving transmitter or moving receiver as I told you before you had for LTI uh, infinitely thin I'm now talking about the new F so it is infinitely thin in the in the new dimension and this is here the bandwidth if you let one of these uh, of the transmitter or receiver move, the same infinitely high wall, infinitely thin, will will make an angle with the with the f uh, axis. But it's still still infinitely high and infinitely thin. Just just you can prove it using some some simple uh, some simple calculations. And now if you have a uh, if you have a, a, a range of movements because. Uh, uh, this is a car moving with a certain uh, in, within within the 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 environment, uh, moving with a certain speed. Another car, another train, and so on. So in this case, you will have a range with a maximum, say, velocity of say a train 500 kilometers. In this case, it will be you will have a transfer function covering uh, this area here. Just just to see, and of course, as you see here, this is here. 10 minus 1 of v naught, the maximum velocity of anything which is moving within the channel divided by the speed of light. Okay. Good. This is one aspect. How can I model time varying uh, channels? The, the next aspect, which type of model should I use? Uh, the most simple model is to say, okay, between the receiver and transmitter, I don't have any, any dispersion, which means as if I would have an uh, infinite bandwidth channel. And if I, if I have an infinite bandwidth channel, what happens to a Dirac delta, an impulse? It is received as an impulse, right? It, it, it will not be wide. And if, if I have now multiple versions of this Dirac delta, they will collide with the wall, come to the receiver after certain delay. As a Dirac delta, but maybe a little bit weaker. Okay, another reflection, another reflection. So the ideal or the idealized response, it is a series of Dirac deltas. Okay, one is delayed by tau one, which is usually the line of sight. One is delayed by tau two, tau three, and so on. Okay, these are the multiple reflections. They have uh, different amplitudes. If you have finite bandwidth, it's really a Dirac delta will be widened. So you can widen this here. Uh, in, in a finite bandwidth uh, pulse. And because the uh, situation of the channel itself changes with the time uh, arbitrary, so you, you don't know whether I'm going in now or something like that, so we may assume, in order to complete the model, that this tau 1 here, it dances. Uh, so uh, uh, without any rule arbitrary and the amplitude too so and this is this is an acceptable model for a wireless chain so i have multiple reflections the strength of each reflection is a stochastic variable and the position the the delay is also stochastic and this is a fairly good model to to assume that this is and if you widen here because of finite bandwidth you will have something like that and now the entire edge of tau, which is a impulse response, will be this collection here, as if I have something <laughs> like that. So I will not now go deep into the details, but I have something like multiple impulses at different times. And this thing here is dancing horizontally as a function of time and dancing vertically as a, as a function. So this is a stochastic process the magnitude, and this is the stochastic process, the time. This is a fairly good model for a wireless channel. And I think it is acceptable to, to assume it this way. So you have here a random variable, tau i of t, and a random variable, ei of t. Okay? Good. 
So now just to refresh your information about uh, what is random process, what is random variable, the, the, the best model is uh, to assume an ensemble, a collection of different realization. Uh, uh, say, say uh, I can measure the quantities. This is here random or stochastic process. I have a realization x1, x2, x3. Each one of these is a deterministic function. And the collection itself uh, looks like a ripple. Of course, it is, if it is distributed all over the y-axis, it has no sense. So it, it is not a good model. But a, it, a good model, which can be used and can be processed afterwards, if you have a situation in which the different realizations are confined in a certain ribbon. Okay? And this is actually what we see in a noise. In a noise, we have the average. And if you have an oscilloscope and you go with a resolution high, you see that this, this very, very clear line becomes a ribbon, okay? And you look, it, is, it dances here, this is, this is a random process. And, and this is actually our model for a random process. In these regards, we uh, define, uh, or we have to do with two dimensions, the, the temporal dimension and the statistical dimensions. If I stay at T naught here, I, I may have this value, this value, this value, this value, and this is a random variable, okay, with a certain probability distribution, okay? If I pick up one of these uh, implementations or, or uh, uh, examples, it is a time function. Now I may define at a certain T naught, I may define a statistical average. Uh, I don't consider it as a time, uh, time varying uh, uh, phenomena. It's just a random variable here, and this is the definition of the, rand of the average of a random variable. Uh, if you take uh, the variable itself, it will be f of x is, is x, huh? and this is the average of x. But you may also find the average of x squared, the average of sine of x, the average. So if you have any function of the variable, uh, of the random variable, you may express uh, its average or the, the average value this way. Uh, if you now pick up one of these, and perform your average as, as a time average, you will have this definition here. One over t, you take t tends to infinity, and you integrate over a window, so you take x1, you define a window here and take the average within this window, and you let the window tends to infinity. This is the temporal average. We have a statistical average and, and, and a temporal average. This is nice till now, but uh, in order to go further, uh, most communication people assume what is called ergodicity. The ergodicity, it is just assumed that whether you average along the time or you average along the statistical axis, you have the same value. Again, you cannot prove that, uh, uh, that uh, a phenomena or a process is ergodic or not. It is just a simplifying assumption and you go further and you get results. If the results support the measurements, I'm fine. If not, I come back to my assumption and say, how can I modify it in order to make it more uh, reliable? So, and this is the way actually models are working. You don't start by assuming the ultimate or the most difficult situation. You say, okay, let us assume that and let us work with that. If I can explain my measurements, if I can communicate, I'm fine. If not, let us come back or go back to our assumptions and see where have we done something wrong. The assumption of ergodicity is a well-known assumption, which means if you ask MATLAB to, uh, to, to you give MATLAB maybe uh, random data and ask MATLAB to uh, uh, find the average or the standard deviation and so on, or it, it always assumes ergodic. So it takes the time samples interpret it as if it was it were a statistical samples. So it assumes implicitly the ergodicity. And this is a very, very useful assumption which helps us. Okay. Back to uh, the conventional MIMO. In conventional MIMO, I have an <laughs> antenna array and here an another antenna array. Now imagine that you have only the line of sight. So in this case, the, each antenna here uh, sends a signal. 
and is received by each antenna there. But because, of the, uh, because the transmitter is far away, all these antennas here, they look for every antenna here as if it were just one antenna. It's far away. So there is no big difference between, between uh, this antenna and this antenna. In other words, I receive at each receiving antenna here a certain linear combination of all these sensing. Just one, one linear combination. And the linear combination received here is exactly the same like the linear combination received here, maybe with a factor, just to multiply it by 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Huh? So in other words, despite the fact that I have here antenna array and here antenna array, and I feed the, the signals here, each individual signal to, to an individual antenna, but all antennas here are receiving a linear combination Signal one constant, times constant one, and so on. Single linear. So now you ask yourself, can I have just one single linear combination, and I can split? Of course not, because in order to split, you need a number of linear combinations, linear independent linear combinations, which are uh, from the number. A number is equal to the number of the transmitting signals. Okay, so one is not enough. One path is not enough. Now, look, if we have in addition to this, this path. This path, because it is another angle, the linear combination here is different. It is again linear combination. I have a sum, weighted sum. It is different. And when it is received here, it is received differently. In other words, each antenna here receives two linear combinations of the uh, send signals. If I have another one, I will have three. The end result is, if I have enough multiple reflections, the receiving antennas can receive different linear combinations so that using a very simple matrix inversion, I can split. This is the core idea of MIMO. MIMO doesn't work in free space environment. MIMO doesn't work when you don't have enough multiple reflection. MIMO works only whatever the number of antennas at the sending at the transmitting size, side, whatever the number of antennas at the receiving side, MIMO needs <coughs> multiple reflections. Of course, you should have or the, the, the best situation, infinite number of multiple reflections, and in this case, it works. And it will not offer you more channels than the number of signals at the transmitting side. It will not offer you more channels than the number of receiving antennas. Because it's something like, I will write down the channel matrix now, it's something like three by five matrix and you, you ask yourself how many independent entity do I have? If all five rows of a five by three antenna are linearly independent, it is not the case because you, you can have a maximum of three because each row is three elements. The maximum number of linearly independent rows is three. And if, if, in reality, these three are not linearly independent, but just two, so you have actually at most two. And actually, in, in the mathematics, this is governed by what is called the rank of the matrix. The rank of the matrix is less than or equal the number of rows, is less than or equal the number of columns. And the best situation is to be this minimum. If I transfer this to MIMO, I can say if I have eight, transmitting antennas and five receiving antennas and three independent multiple reflection, I have a maximum of rank three. If the number of maximum of multiple reflections is 10, the minimum is five, so I can have only five. And if you are involved in uh, singular value decomposition and so on, any program which performs singular value decomposition can tell you immediately how many uh, independent piece of information, and in our case here, how many independent channel 
uh, are you going to have? Okay, this is here without going through complicated equations. Uh, I, I will leave this presentation to Dr. Uh, Akhtar, so you can have a copy of it. This is just just expression for that. This is the the kth path, a linear combination of all send signal. This is the received at antenna number n. It is a linear combination of all paths. If you put each this in this, you will have the nth received signal is a linear combination of the of all mth send signal the important thing is whether this is here this is the the channel what's called channel matrix whether this channel matrix is uh, has a rank of one or two or three if you look to the to the uh, expression of the uh, of the element here the uh, rank is actually determined by the number of the multipath Okay, this is the case if I go from discrete multiple reflection to continuous, just, just for completeness. And I will have this expression for, for the uh, channel matrix. Uh, this is here a study because uh, I think I still have only 20 minutes. Study of what's actually the uh, best situation I can have from two antenna arrays, if I assume infinite number of multiple reflections, yeah? So, uh, when you have multiple reflections, do you have from some level of threshold that level which I can assume or is it like a noise, so is it something related to SNR which you can assume it to be signal or is it like just noise? No, uh, but of course this is, this is done by the, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you involve a singular value decomposition, and the singular value decomposition you must say, okay, the singular value decomposition will give you uh, maybe infinite number of, uh, of uh, outputs, but you usually say, okay, any singular value below this, and, and you take the noise level and say, okay, any singular value below this uh, is noise. And you can easily show that the program itself uh, gives you the, the, the each, each singular value is a one of the multiple reflections. So you will have something like, uh, this is the line of sight, if it is not obstacle, uh, and then it goes down, 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 and you have some others, some additional, but now you say, okay, this may have been caused by noise, this additional multiple reflection, so I will put my threshold here, and say, okay, it seems that I have, I just have five multiple reflection or three multiple reflection, depending on the threshold. Okay, and this is one of the of the uh, of the uh, say of the skills. Uh, where should I put uh, my threshold in order to interpret a, a singular value as one of the uh, of the multiple reflections? So this is here a very very simplified study. Uh, of if I have the channel matrix, uh, which condition should be fulfilled by the transmitting array and the receiving array in order to have a full rank matrix? So uh, it is based on some assumptions related to ergodicity and so on. If you look to the equations afterwards, and you can you can send me an email if you don't understand any of this because just just to to uh, uh, cover this quickly. So you can uh, describe the linear dependency between two rows of the matrix or two columns by the matrix of the matrix by considering them as vectors in n-dimensional space. And you build uh, the angle between both as, as, as the traditional uh, angle between two vectors in n-dimensional space. I did it this way and I replaced the usual multiplication by averaging process, by uh, correlation. Because we don't, we don't have a single value, we, we average out. So I just replaced the usual multiplication you use in order to find the angle between two vectors by, convolution, uh, by, uh, by correlation. And uh, if you follow the analysis, you will find out that the uh, linear dependency or linear independency is covered by the value, this value here, which is the difference between 
two rows or two columns. I'm talking now about the linear dependence between nth row and lth row or between mth column and k column. And this is here related to the distance between two successive elements in the receiving <coughs> array related to the wavelength. And this is here related to uh, the, the transmitting array. And if you are working, say, this value here is too small, whether you are, you, you are dealing with two nearby columns, uh, columns are receiving arrays and, and, and uh, no, columns are transmitting ar array and, and, and rows are receiving arrays. If they are nearby, you have a smaller quantity. If they are far away, you have a bigger quantity. Uh, but the minimum is one. You have two successive. And now you have this ratio here. Now if you look, uh, you have linearly dependent if you are very near to zero. You have linearly independent and you can invert the matrix if you go here further. So, and this is a rough estimation if, if I have uh, the distance between successive elements in the order of magnitude of lambda by four, I can have this theta between the two vectors in the order of magnitude of 60 degree, which is, is good enough for inversion. So as a rule of thumb, this is not a, not a sharp edge. We just say, okay, uh, in order to uh, make use of the MIMO, I should have in the channel matrix, channel matrix connects received signal with the transmitted signal. In order to have a good condition, I must have arrays with uh, element separation in the order of magnitude of lambda by four, okay? Lambda by two would be better, but don't forget that lambda itself at higher frequencies is small and you can accommodate your antennas in a smartphone. And this is actually the, uh, the next picture. Uh, the next picture, if I have uh, typical dimensions here of a, of a smartphone of 15 times seven, and I'm working here at, the, at, at our current 4G uh, frequency band, I can accommodate maximum of two antennas. If I go to five giga, I can accommodate by four. Whether 5G will work, I, I put here a question mark, because there are discussions now, we will work for a couple of years uh, below six, and we will go to, uh, to 28 later. By the way, beginning of 2017, they are to were talking about a band at 16. <laughs> All of a sudden, because I told one of you uh, during uh, a discussion, the all aspects here are not technical aspects. It is influential aspects. You have uh, what is called International Telecommunication Union, ITU. It collects representatives from all, the, all over the world, and they discuss which frequency band. Now, the Americans, they have a, say, famous university like University of South Florida. They invested lots of money to uh, develop millimeter wave at 28 mega, uh, gigahertz. Now they push and try to dictate the 28. At the same time, in China, there is another place which pushes for 37 giga. Pract uh, so uh, technically, really, there is no technical aspects which can tell us 28 or 37. Uh, huh? Yeah, but, but if you look really, it is, it is from the design, from the systems and so on, it, no, no big issue. But it is again money making. And money making means if I succeed to dictate my standards, I will sell. And I will be millionaire, multi-millionaire, multi-billionaire. And this also explains why countries uh, with high population like India and China uh, became much more important than high-tech countries like uh, United States and Europe only because you are a good market. They can sell more in a country like India or in a country like China than in a country like Germany. Germany is just 80 million. Okay? They can sell very expensive, but nevertheless, this is BNAT. 
But if, if I sell to one-tenth of the price in India or in China, I will make money. Therefore, the weight in the decision-making process of highly populated countries become much, much more important than in low population countries where the, mar the market is dictating nowadays. Why I'm telling you now uh, that because, <coughs> again, the discussion here is technically irrelevant. 16, 28, maybe this Samsung, tiny... Samsung already took Korea. Excuse me? Samsung already in in Korea. Sam Samsung, because Samsung also, these big companies, they, they, they have no owner. They, they are multinational and depending on... Because the world nowadays is, is crazy. So although Samsung is from South Korea, but you may have the, uh, the uh, say, the motors uh, staying in, in the United States or staying in maybe in, Braz in Brazil. So the uh, decision-making process is, uh, is not technical at all. It is how can you make much more money and also if you have influence because, uh, not necessarily uh, because you are correct, but uh, I plan to have money from you so I will assist you here. Some sort of corruption, but it's a very, very clean corruption. So, uh, so it, is, it is something like that. It is, say, in a gray zone, uh, and you have to live with. But just, just, just uh, uh, why I'm telling you that, because we as engineers, we as scientists and researchers, we can have fantastic solutions. And by the end of the day, nothing happens. Not because you are wrong, but because you are weak, because you are economically weak. You must, as, as, as engineers, you must keep this in mind. It is not necessarily the technical aspects, the engineering aspects, the scientific aspects. Sometimes uh, your relation to this company or your weight here, or this also explains why we are poor. The scientists are usually poor. Uh, the most rich people are uh, business people. And if you, if you talk to a business guy, you have the impression he's stupid because you understand more than him. And you say, okay, this is unfair world. It is, it is really fair because he can or she can sell himself better than you can. You, you have your language, you live much higher and you look to the people as, oh, this is our idiots here. In, in fact, we are the idiots. <laughs> in terms of money. <laughs> so it is just, just to, to combine. So the, the scientific skill alone doesn't say anything. If you, um, if you know somebody and you can sell yourself goods, he likes you, uh, and you can influence his decision making. And I know really people, also scientists, in my opinion, they have nothing to do with science. But they can they sit together with you and hear this expression, massive mind. He has nothing to do with massive mind. I'm, or IoT. He just registered here. In the next meeting, he sits with other idiots, but they 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 have money, and tries to tell these unknown expressions. Just to make the impression, I know it. He doesn't know it. But he learned from you and could use it very, very cleverly in order to give the impression he knows it. And now the other idiot says, okay, he's an expert now. Let me give, let, let, let me give him the, the contract. This is the way many, many things happen nowadays. <laughs> okay, back to our lecture. <laughs> okay, so let us now, so the um, conditioning of the matrix and how, uh, how we measure it, also the distance between the antennas, and uh, actually the main aspect was here. Uh, of course, the higher the frequencies, uh, the better you can accommodate antennas, and, and uh, based on what I told you before, uh, this number of antennas is the maximum number of independent data streams you can achieve. The, the base station, it doesn't have any problem because it has big space. The, uh, 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 the problem is with the mobile station. But at the same time, don't forget that your capability of uh, producing 
high frequency power or microwave power or millimeter wave power goes down with the frequency. You can, you can produce, say, what? Kilowatt, maybe at one giga. Base station can produce multiple of kilowatts. But if you are now going to millimeter wave, you, you are happy if you can have power combiner uh, producing a couple of watts for the base station. So this is, of course, a problem. And this also dictates I can increase the number of data streams by increasing the frequency. But because I'm not able to produce high power, even if I would have been able, the regulation authority comes to me and say, no, pay attention. You have what is called spectral mask. Your uh, produced power or generated power at this frequency is not allowed to be more than that because you are interfering with somebody else. So for each band, the regulation authority, each country has its own regulation authority. The regulation authority defines, and this is actually one of the things which are discussed within the definition of the standard of 5G, this spectral mask. You are not allowed to, to radiate stronger than that. And this tells me, okay, this is the maximum distance I can communicate. This means the higher the frequency, the higher the number of antennas I can use for MIMO, the higher the number of independent data streams, but at the same time, the shorter the distance I can communicate. And this means we, will, we cannot rely on base station far away from us. Therefore, what is planned is to bring the base station or intermediate stations, nano stations, pico stations, okay, very, very near to you. Or, so one of the thoughts which I, which I heard in one of the conferences is you have a street and you have the, Latin, uh, the, the light masts. They intend to put antenna arrays on the light mast. So, so the mast itself communicates with the base station and you communicate with the mast. So this is one of the scenarios. Okay, so you will see many crazy scenarios depending on which frequency, which range can I communicate, how much data streams can I have, and so on. Okay? Okay, this, uh, yeah, in these regards, we should distinguish, I know it is one, uh, I need another 10 minutes maybe. We should distinguish between two developments in the communication, the Wi-Fi, which is much more advanced than the mobile communication. The Wi-Fi, it is this access point. And this access point has already achieved much more development than the mobile data. If you have your smartphone, you have two icons, one for Wi-Fi or, uh, and, and, and the, the other one for mobile data. Mobile data means the data streams come from the mobile network, it is a telephone company. 5G, 4G, and so on, these are development for the communication for the mobile companies. They have nothing to do with the Wi-Fi access point behind you here. This is here very small, and they have already MIMO. They have already, of course, the standards, all, both use OFDM orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, but, but the uh, standard itself, the definition, uh, the frequency bands and, and so on are different. You may for $50 have an access point working N and AC with the 3x3 MIMO, as I told in the, in the, in the past lecture, up to 1,300 uh, megabit per second using MIMO and so on. This is actually uh, the MIMO from the perspective of Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi are uh, governed by the standards IEEE 802.11, and then you have, a, you have a letter. You have A, B, A in the United States. I don't know in India whether you followed the European or you, the Europe followed you. It depends who, who starts. Um, a and G are the same but A was in the States and G was in, the, uh, in Europe. Uh, B was all over the world. B had uh, 11 megabit per second. A and, C, A and G had, uh, still have 
54, uh, 54 megabit per second. And N has pro channel because N involves also MIMO, uh, 150 megabit per second per channel. So you may have, if you have a three data streams using MIMO, with N you can go up to 450 megabits per second. AC has per stream 433 megabit per second. If you have two streams, you have uh, 866 or three channels and so on. This is, these are just numbers and these systems exist already. This is actually your access point here. And I can imagine this one here, I know the company, I think it is, uh, I think it, it has a three by three MIMO and it works with AC and N. So uh, such an access point uh, can, can deliver up to 1.3 gigabit per second. As you see, it is much more mature than what you have in your mobile data. Mobile data, this is telephone company. Uh, also the base station, in this case, this access point can serve you with two data streams and another guy with one data stream. As I told you before, in, uh, in AC, uh, you have a maximum of eight, I think. But here, this picture here is, is four. And these four can be distributed, uh, two for one user, one for the second, and, and, and so on. So, and this is, this is as I told you, this, uh, this Wi-Fi standard is uh, the example <coughs> for 5G. In 5G, okay, this is again uh, the WLAN or the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is known in the States as Wi-Fi, and in Europe it is called the uh, wireless LAN. Now for, for the mobile data, you have a completely different development. 4G, uh, you have two versions. The first one was called long-term uh, evolution, LTE, or long-term evolution advanced. And as an intermediate stage to 5G, they have LTE A Pro. This is below six giga. And if you go to the millimeter wave, you have NR, which is new radio. Uh, this is actually discussion now, uh, whether we take uh, the 28 uh, giga or 37. And there is another development uh, towards uh, 94 gigahertz. Uh, Professor Akhtar will tell you tomorrow uh, about the, uh, why these numbers, why 28, why 37, and why 94, 77, uh, based on uh, the attenuation of the atmosphere for a specific frequency. Therefore, you don't hear, uh, you hear 60, you hear uh, 77 or 94, but you never hear 50, why not 50? So there are factors for that. Okay, so again, I think this, I explained this, these are the form of the, uh, of the nano cells in future. This is a cellular structure. I showed this also before, this is some base station with uh, 256, uh, serving a mobile with up to 16. The uh, specifications I told, I, I spoke about it before, and this also the forms of the, maybe this one here is just to refresh your information about beam forming and uh, how uh, the antenna characteristic looks like uh, in three dimensions. If I mount the antenna on a mast, uh, what is the uh, elevation angle, what is the uh, azimuthal angle, and, and so on. But I guess for antenna people, you, you are acquainted with that. You don't need, the, this is a very, very simple expression. Uh, here, if I have a two-dimensional antenna with the dx separation in the x direction, dy uh, in the y direction, this is a form of uh, the radiation pattern. And I can, I have in my hand, uh, the amplitude of excitation for the individual elements, n and m is x and y, and, uh, the, uh, this one here has also can be uh, equipped with an additional phase in order to be able to steer the beam. If you, if you have equiphase <coughs> excitation of all, and you have here equi-amplitude excitation, you will have in the two-dimensional the well-known sync function. 
it is not sync, but it is uh, this uh, sine n psi by two divided by sine e psi by two. This which 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 works like the sync function, but but for uh, discrete world. Of course, with wind wing, you may uh, attenuate the magnitudes at the sides. You may play with the main lobe and the side lobes. And I think any one of you who had a fundamental course on signal processing, he or she knows what is wind doing. How can I make the main lobe wider uh, in order to reduce the effect of the side lobes? And uh, all these aspects will be part also. What, what you have in signal processing, uh, it is the same theory. It is the same background like in antenna arrays. And uh, this depends afterwards. Would you like to have a wide beam, but much lower side lobes for the same number of antenna elements? Or you say, no, no, I would like to have a narrow and uh, higher uh, side lobe. You know, if you, if you have a window, if you, if you have the rectangular window, you have uh, uh, 16 point, no, uh, how much uh, suppression? I think it is 13.6. 13.6 dB, right? 13.6. And if you have a triangle, uh, triangular window, you may increase it to 24 or something. I, I, I forgot the numbers now. But it is actually uh, well-known calculations which you can uh, make use of in order to control the beam form wide and, and the side beams. And of course, using the, uh, the uh, phase progression, in x direction and y direction, you may uh, shift the beam or steer the beam in this direction or in this direction. This is here, for example, just for if you take the phase angle of uh, element n m given by this here, you can direct the beam to the direction theta given by e by this one and direction phi given by this one. V very simple calculations, it's not, not a big issue. Okay, the, ju just to see how can I, I form the beam, make it wide, small, reduce the side lobes and so on, and how can I steer it in, in two dimensions. <coughs> okay. Uh, the uh, multiple signal transmission, this is actually how can I produce simultaneously multiple beams with the same antenna array. And this needs what is called Butler matrix. So actually, the Butler matrix is a system. Usually, it is a combination of couplers and phase shifters. Uh, you have a number of uh, data streams and the number of antennas, not necessarily the same. Typically, you will have 10, up to 10 data streams and, and something like 256 in antenna elements. And now, you would like to produce 10. The number of antennas influence how how, how narrow the stream is. It can work only for one stream, with only one input. Uh, the number of inputs, this is how many such beams can be produced. Okay, And the, the network between is called Butler matrix. This is also, uh, or, or there is also, I don't know whether you are acquainted also with what is called Rotman lens. It is a, a, a strip line. Uh, continuous uh, structure which perform the same function like a Butler matrix. This is here which I showed before. And I think together with the other one, uh, I'm done with this presentation. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Or You mean, therefore, I told you, if you, uh, the, the future scenarios, it is not directly between the mast, the high mast and you. Uh, one of the scenarios, whether this is the final scenario or not, I don't know, because they are uh, negotiating now. You may have an intermediate base stations, which are nearer to you as a user and communicate directly with you. And this will, uh, will uh, communicate further. The advantage of intermediate stations, they are stationary. So the base station itself 
doesn't need to um, to track or to move the beams it, it directs the beam say to this intermediate the intermediate of course the complexity is much less you have many of them they are nearer to the user and they will steer and follow you where are you going and maximize the power to you or stop the power to you in order to talk with somebody else the scenario itself for those of you who are involved in mobile communication is very very uh, creative so actually you have everything for example the power control if you are disturbing somebody else it say okay it brings your power amplifier to zero the base station in order to let you shut mouse and allow the other one to talk and so on so all these scenarios i'm not i'm not the uh, say the uh, the expert the expert here this is uh, communication aspects i, I uh, deal basically with the microwave and the antenna aspects. Okay? Any other? Yes? So what would be a uh, typical power level <coughs> of the source in the base station? Depending on the frequency, because now you are happy if you can have in millimeter wave some pair, pair generator, uh, say a couple of milliwatts. But you will have the power combiner. You may combine also in free space. There are at, at millimeter wave, you may have power combiners as an antenna. So you know if you if you have an antenna array, uh, you can uh, produce array or a beam directed into a certain direction. Imagine now that you have this is this is something else now. Imagine now that you would like to produce 10 milliwatts, but each individual oscillator is capable of producing just one milliwatt. You need what is called power combiner. A power combiners usually these are circuits, so you can have a, a say a 10 port uh, feeding uh, the different signals from the different ports, and you have a single out port. But at higher frequency, you may also mix. You may also combine powers in free space by feeding the different antennas of an antenna array with the different oscillators. And uh, configure the phase difference in such a way that they produce a narrow beam in a certain direction. And you have your receiver at this direction. You can amplify more using amplifier, but you used the characteristic of an antenna array for power combining because you feed low power they are combined in a certain direction of course at lower frequency it is infeasible because you need huge uh, huge antenna arrays and so on so based on <coughs> how can a millimeter wave oscillator uh, produce power in, in which order of magnitude terahertz for example you are happy if you have microwatt so we are, we, we are far away from the milliwatt and the watt ranges. Yes? So what is the advantage of using uh, MIMO in radars? In radars, in, in, because in radar, we, we talked here about, uh, about data streams. Imagine now that you are in an airplane and you are following multiple planes tracking and communicating let us forget the the communicating but MIMO in radar it's actually was a technique for radar because if you if you are uh, tracking a target you need just one beam and you can move the beam with the target uh, if it is an enemy or something like that but for MIMO it is and, and it is Actually, the, the, the first application of MIMO, the, the first application of MIMO was not communication. It came from the military. Maybe in the 60s and 70s, they developed that in order for a radar station to simultaneously track and detect multiple targets. Because otherwise, you need a radar for each aeroplane. So you are attacked now by 10. Should you, and, and you don't know how many are attacking you. And now you, you follow and you would like to distinguish between uh, enemy and own uh, aeroplanes. So you, this is one of the applications producing multiple beams and making these beams uh, steered independently so that I am following this, this and that and that. 
This is this is actually the uh, the the uh, initial application or the first application for MIMO. It was in the radar and in the military. Okay. <coughs> 